Hi, I'm Bob Garrett. Hackensack University Health Network believes that all citizens need to be informed about the important health issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, everyone deserves a healthy smile, the Northward Center, Josh S. Weston, the Russell Berry Foundation, Investors Bank, and by NJM, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and stability. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands, and by Politicker NJ. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to the Tisch WNT studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center. Uh, I'm Steve Adubato. It's my pleasure to welcome Tom Burry, who is uh, construction manager, the Food Network's Restaurant Impossible, owner of uh, Division 9 Design and Construction. How you doing? Great, great. For those who don't know uh, Restaurant Impossible, describe it. We're coming into a restaurant. We're, we're saving a restaurant. So you've got a restaurant that's failing. They ask us for help. We come in. Our host, uh, Robert Irvine, who's a super talented chef. We come in and do the whole thing. So he's coming in, he's changing the atmosphere, telling, the, telling them what they're doing wrong, changing the food, and then me and a the designer are coming in and we're changing the look of the restaurant. So it's from a top to bottom change on the entire space. It's kind of, it's, and we do this in 48 hours, which is, I still don't know how we do it. But. Now, it's interesting, you came to us, uh, our friends over at the New Jersey Institute of Technology mm -hmm. told us about you, and I'm curious, when you were graduating from there with a degree in? Architecture. Did you say to yourself, I'm gonna wind up on television doing this? Absolutely not. What was the plan? <laughs> it's, you know, at NJIT, I, I, I love the school, I work with them all the time, and you know, you graduate from college and you've got a degree in architecture, so you're looking, you're looking at the road one way, I'm, I'm gonna be an architect, I'm gonna work in an architecture firm, and I went and tried that, and it's just like, I kept, I kept veering off in different ways, and I started my own construction company and started doing sure. all these different things. And then the TV show just kind of spawned off of that whole thing. It oh. was, yeah, I was working with designers here in New York City. We're doing restaurants. Uh, they got cast on the show to be the designers for the show, and they asked me to come along, and they told me this crazy concept. It was the pilot. Uh, two days, $10,000, we're going to redo this restaurant. And I'm looking at them and oh, we're Oh, back up. Tell everyone again the concept. Over 48 hours. 48 hours. So it's two. So they say two days, which is 48 hours. We don't even get that. It ends up being about 35, th maybe 36 hours. By the time you get in there set up, you know, you're doing TV stuff as well. So you're cutting in. we got to stop. You can't do construction stop while you're filming. Stop, do that again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or work. Guys, everybody work quietly in the background. I've never seen construction <laughs> that's quiet, but uh, we do it somehow. Uh, with two days, $10,000. So I came in, uh, we shot the pilot. First time I ever did a TV show, I did it just for fun. I figured we go in, you know, the guys would love it, we'll try it. And uh, it was a hit. I, I, I became great friends with the host, Robert Irvine. We're still we're great friends right now. And uh, gosh, it's been 100 and, 150 episodes. It's been <laughs> since two, 2011. How it has it changed your professional and personal life? It's. It's impacted everything. It's impacted everything I do. I mean, first off, especially my career goals, like you just said, I graduated and I, I thought I'd be an architect and then, and then I started a construction company. I was just like, well, if I get a good construction company, I can make some money, I'd be happy doing that. And now it's opened up all these other avenues that we're doing. But the show itself, what we really do for people and the, the, the limited time frame and the limited budget, it's, it's amazing. And it's, uh, it, like I said, when I was doing the pilot, I thought it was impossible. I'm like, you can't do that, right? I mean, That's I do the name. You know, exactly, exactly. And I do the, work the, in New York City. How, how do these, sorry for interrupting, how do these people get picked? <clears throat> they, a lot of them apply online, I believe it is, and the producers kind of sift through them and decide who it, you know, I don't get any say in that whatsoever. So but, you go into a restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. And it looks like what? It, they're usually a, the worst restaurant you can imagine. Carpets, 
smells bad, the, the kitchen's a, you know, a disaster, and the owners don't really, wallpaper, ceiling tiles falling down, and they think the restaurant's great. So they walk in, and they go, I don't know why nobody's coming into my restaurant. I can't imagine why people don't eat here. And, and they do think you the food's great, you know, and it's not. Well, hold, hold on, do you guys do a makeover physically as well as the whole, I mean, everything? Everything. From what to describe the, the whole from, thing? From, from the food, the service, the way the, the, way the place functions, how servers get to table, to the actual look of the place. I mean, if you think about it, all of those, you go to a restaurant, every single one of those pieces makes a difference whether you're gonna come back or not. And if one of those things fails, odds are you're probably not gonna come back. So we, we spend a lot of time, you know, and, we, and again, it's time management because we're only there for two days. So we really focus on what's the worst thing in the restaurant and we kind of work our way backwards and try to, try to fix it for these people. I'm curious about this. Mm -hmm. You've seen a lot of restaurants, You've worked around a lot of restaurants, mm -hmm. he, either here in New York City, New Jersey, you know this market well. What are the most common mistakes restaurant owners make that often cause them to fail? You know, it's t obviously, it, it, I'm, an, I'm an architect and a designer, so I, I love to look at the look of the, the, the design and the look of the restaurant. And that is a portion of it. Food is definitely number one, right? You're going to a restaurant, you're going to eat. I mean, you've been to a bunch of dive places, I'm sure, that have amazing food, and you keep going back because the food is just fantastic. So if you don't have that fantastic level of food, the restaurant also has to look and feel comfortable. The biggest mistake I think most, most restaurateurs make is the comfort level. If people come in and they, and people aren't designers, they walk into a place, they just feel uncomfortable. I mean, you've been to a restaurant where for whatever, whatever reason, you just didn't like it in there. And that could have been, it's too loud, uh, it, or the lighting. Lighting is a big one, which I always say, because you go in, it's too bright or it's too dark, and it's just not comfortable, it doesn't work. And the, the loud is the biggest problem, because you go in and you're, you're trying to have a conversation with somebody, you're paying a lot of money for a meal, and you can't even hear anybody, it doesn't work. What about when you're sitting here, and there with your wife, and the people are sitting like six inches away from you? <laughs> well, you know, that's, a whole, that? that's a whole different thing. That, you know, New York City, it, it, it works a whole different way than the rest of the country, but some people, I guess, and, but that works, that works too, because certain places like New York City, people have a comfort level. They're, they're a little bit more comfortable being closer to people. How about in Jersey? We, we don't like that? In, Jer in Jersey, it's a little bit more spread out, but I'll, I'll tell you what, you go into the middle of the country, <laughs> that table's gotta be four feet away or they are not sitting down. They will not sit there. So interesting, culturally, mm -hmm. geographically, restaurants and the way they're designed, they're different. 100% different. 100% different. Have you ever sat at a, um, uh, like a big banquet table or a chef table, right? Where you're sitting, you're sitting two by two by two. Yeah. You're with somebody else and there's somebody else next to you. That works here, that works in New Jersey, that might work in some cities. How about Wisconsin? Absolutely not. No way. They will not sit at that table. They will not sit. Even if you leave a space between the two, it's considered the same table, they won't sit there because it's the same surface top. So they're not comfortable with it. And that's, and that's something I learned because, again, I'm a Jersey guy and I do all my work in New York City or most of it, and I learned so much just traveling the country going, why, why, I don't understand, why don't you feel comfortable? It's, you're three feet away, what's well, the same table? I, I guess, you're right, I mean, it is technically the same table. Very different, uh, tell mm -hmm. us about your construction company, Division Nine Design and Construction. Division Nine is, uh, you know, me and my partners, we're all architects, and uh, we started it because of a, a, just a need for, for a good construction company that was gonna follow the plans all the way through. And we work on restaurants, and obviously with restaurants, there's a, it's a tough time frame because you got a restaurant tour, he's opening, he's gotta open on time. Uh, you're trying to, there's a lot of custom details because every restaurant's gotta top every other restaurant. You can't go buy something off the shelf, you gotta build it custom. So we spend a lot of time doing that, and because we're architects, we pride ourselves on you know, focusing on those details and making sure they're right and not just doing it for the bottom dollar and getting mm -hmm. out of there quick and you know, cheap, making it cheap and walking away and going, well, we've, you know, it's close enough. We, we pride ourselves on getting the next job off of that first restaurant we did. Before I let you out here real quick, uh, with Restaurant Impossible, you turn these restaurants around, make them look a lot better, mm -hmm. set them up to succeed. To what degree do you have a sense that these folks who run these restaurants keep them functioning and moving in the right direction? I, I mentioned before, I, we've, we're over 150 restaurants right now. And I, I believe our success rate was somewhere over 70%. And really? think about it, think about that. So you've got, we, we went to see 150 failing restaurants, 
failing. There was some we had to pay the gas bill that day. Oh. Some we had the, the power wasn't on. That bad. And at least 70% of them move forward. And some people, you know, they're just, they're just hard-headed. They don't want change. So you, you offer them change, you show them change, and they go right back. And there's nothing we can do about that. I mean, I can't. And some people are just too far behind. They just can't catch up. I mean, there's just nothing you can do. Some people make it out and they sell it. And maybe that's a win because guess what? Not everyone should be in the restaurant business. It's not cut out for everyone. No, no, absolutely not. Tom, you're doing good stuff. Construction manager, Food Network's restaurant impossible, and also owner of Division 9 Design and Construction uh, and an alum of the great New Jersey Institute of Technology. Good stuff. Appreciate it. Thank you. Stay right there. One-on-one. -on -one from the Tisch WNET studio here in New York City. We'll continue right after this. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. That's great. Visit us online at steveautobato.org. Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to have Dr. Nicholas Paracone, a board-certified dermatologist, healthy aging expert and no stranger to the world of PBS. Uh, eight specials that you've done in public broadcasting. Um, how, do, how and when did you get into the aging process? Uh, you know, I started looking at the aging process um, probably in medical school. I was looking under the microscope, uh, which we had to do an awful lot of, at a, uh, actually a tumor, a squamous cell cancer, and it was surrounded by inflammation. And I talked to my professor, I said, is it possible that the inflammation is driving this process? And he said, no, no, it's just an effect of the immune system. I thought that was a strange answer because cancer has a way of bypassing the immune system. That's why we get into trouble. And I saw inflammation in arteries if there was atherosclerosis, and I saw it in brain tissue if there was Alzheimer's, and started putting together these clues that I thought that inflammation was driving a lot of these disease processes, especially aging, because when I did dermatology, we had to look at a lot of specimens under the skin. And aging skin had absolute evidence of inflammation, but younger skin had no inflammation. And we're talking about aging skin without pathology there. Why was there inflammation? Mm. And uh, I was also, uh, I'm also a nutritionist. Yes. And so I thought about, well, we, I'm convinced inflammation is what's driving these processes, but what is causing the inflammation? Well, in the skin, it's pretty easy. You know, we're interfaced between us and our environment, and so sunlight and a lot of other things and pollution. But what about this inflammation we can measure internally with things like C-reactive protein? C-reactive protein. C? C? Hyphen. Reactive, reactive protein. protein. Now, that's a, it's, a, it's a lab test. And it actually measures uh, through measures of certain proteins that uh, how, <clears throat> how much inflammation is actually going on in your body. See, the problem with inflammation, it, it, is, it, it is not visible. We can't feel it. We can't see it. But it goes on all the time. And the more inflammation, then the more rapid is the destruction of, of major organ systems, and of course, including skin. Mm. And so the idea was, well, what's driving this? And I started looking at it and very closely, and being a nutritionist, figured out that foods can either be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, depending on what category we choose. And uh, started looking and started designing a diet that was just rich in a lot of fruits and vegetables, phytochemicals. Uh, phyto? Phytochemicals. phytochemicals. That's, that's spelled P-H-Y-T-O, phyto. Phyto. Uh, and phytochemicals are amazing things because they contain antioxidants, but they also trigger our body's own defenses to reduce free radical damage and inflammation at the Such same as. time. Let's name some of the... Our people are very... Um, they want to know exactly what we're talking about. So, so if they're, they're writing down right now, they're going to Google right, so, it. What are we talking about uh, here? If there are a lot of colors in your fruits and vegetables, you know there's a lot of phytochemicals. And so you want to have a whole array, a rainbow of colors every day because by taking, selecting different ones, they have different protection. For Is example, that what we're talking about? Uh, if we look there, if we look there, yes, okay. So of course I recommend um, salmon because it's a great source of protein. You know, we, we need to have protein every day to repair our cells. And, if, and actually there was, a, there was a nutritionist that said on the days we don't eat enough protein are the days we age. Is that right? It is, it is true. We need that to repair. Uh, then you'll see melons and you'll see um, uh, some green vegetables here. That's very important. But doctor, I see, is that chocolate? That's not chocolate. That's chocolate, right. Wait a minute. <laughs> Everything in moderation. Well, what are we talking about okay, here? We're talking about high cocoa level chocolate. So 70% cocoa. Go ahead. And so there's very little sugar there. Uh, there's a little bit of neutral fats, which are not pro-inflammatory. And chocolate contains some very powerful phytochemicals that reduce inflammation and also give you energy. If mm. you want to get if you want to get up and really get moving, uh, whatever I do before I actually do an interview is I have a square of 70% chocolate. 
And it's much better. Is that right? Than, it's much better than a cup of coffee or tea. See, you know, the coffee thing, um, all right? Not, not, okay. So they asked me. I go, black coffee, just black. You were talking to a lot of our folks. The word around here in the public television studio, WNET, is you were talking about green tea. Right. What's wrong with this? Well, coffee is actually, it's a good liquid. It does contain... Um, these are long days, doctor. Right. These, <laughs> it does contain, you know, caffeine's an antioxidant. Yes. And it also contains some phytochemicals. That's why it has color to All it. All right. However, it contains organic acids. And these organic acids make our blood sugar kind of go like this. Mm. And when blood sugar's up, insulin goes up, and that puts a lock on your body fat. So I tell people that if they switch out from coffee to tea, doing nothing else differently, they will lose about 10 pounds in about four to six weeks. Now, I've been challenged on this with CNN, and uh, it was funny, I did, I did my uh, interview, and the woman was slightly overweight, and she said, I'm gonna try this, but if it doesn't work, I'm taking you back, I want you back in Atlanta to face the music. And she called me about 12 days into it, and she said, I've already lost five pounds. My apologies. From coffee to tea? Coffee to tea. Because? Once again, uh, coffee contains organic acids that will kick up your blood sugar when you have, and it kicks up insulin, right? When, when blood sugar goes up, insulin is secreted. Insulin puts a lock on your body fat. So it's not allowing, so you're exercising. You and I were talking right before we got on the air about exercise routines, um, and you just totally blew away something I already was thinking about, importance of cardio. Never mind, we'll go there another time. It is important, but it's moderation. Important. Moderation. Moderation. <clears throat> I'm gonna ask you this. Can you sh talk to us about what you brought in? Because this is really important. Okay, sure. So this is, a, this is the company, Periquest. Periquest, go ahead. And I started the company right after 9-11 because I was concerned about our national security. And so the first thing I worked on was a way to protect commercial airlines from shoulder-held rockets, which, was a, which is a huge threat, and it still is. And I developed a program for them. And then Homeland Security, once I was working on it for a few years, mandated that Congress come up with the money to protect all commercial airlines. Uh, the problem was that uh, the bids that were really looked at uh, were some of the larger companies, and they wanted a, they said it was anywhere from one to five million dollars per airplane, so it made it cost prohibitive. Now mine was about one tenth of that, and I thought it worked better. But what happened is I received a letter from the government with my patents were issued that they were making my uh, technology secret for national security reasons, and we have not seen uh, Heidner here of that invention since then. Uh, it's sitting somewhere in the governmental bureaucracy. And of course, we can't use the technology, right. which I think is critical. And uh, so we're trying to move that forward with um, some help from our, our, our um, senators. Laser defensive? Yes, this is one of the events. Eyewear. Okay, so I was, at a, I was at a security meeting with Paraquest, and I was approached by someone. They said, I have a problem. We have a problem. And the problem is, this was three years ago, that we are getting a lot of attacks on commercial airlines landing, people are shining lasers into the eyes of the pilots as they're landing. Right. Can you come up with a solution? So I thought it over and I thought I had a solution. Uh, so I talked to my chief technology officer who is a optical physicist. I said, this is my idea, this is what I'd like to do. Will it work? She said, yes, I think it will work. It's gonna take a lot of engineering and a lot of money. So we did a full court press for two years. We developed the glasses and now we have them. And I wanted to make the glasses that were light usable, because pilots have to wear them, right? And they also have to block all forms of lasers, not just the green lasers, but green, red, and blue, because that's what's out there. Right. In addition to that hurdle, we had to say that you, we're gonna block red, blue, and green, but we're gonna be able to see color discrimination. And so that was the engineering part, the real big engineering part. And we have to also give protection at all angles. So when I put these on, and if a laser's coming from the side, mm. all of this is completely protected. Right. But I can still see colors. I can see your tie. I can look out and, and see a number of colors. I can read all the instruments in an airplane. I can read the iPad they use for navigation. And so we're ready to go. But once again, full court press, we, we we're producing now. But nobody's stepping up uh, to get the protection. Can you wear these day or night, Doctor? These are the day version. They're, they're right. tinted. And then the night version are actually um, almost clear. As you can see right. that. You want to put those on? Sure. So this is night. This is the. That's the night. So you, right. so you get all the you, know, you get all the light through. You can see color discrimination, but you are protected. Now you'll see the laser, but it's not going to dazzle you. You'll still be able to, to do all the functions you need to do. You can see the source. You can report it to the police, uh, but your eyes are protected. And if you get hit with the laser, you know you really da we call it dazzle, and you really have trouble seeing for yeah. several minutes. If it's a high-powered laser, and many are, there's actual retinal damage, permanent damage to the pilots. But right now it's not. They don't have access to it. 
Well, it's here, it's waiting, uh, but no one's stepping up. We've In met the government, with, I can't imagine. They haven't moved quickly? Uh, no, <laughs> we went, I've gone to all the air security meetings. Yeah, we're, we're, we're talking to everybody. And uh, I guess that answers its own, your, yeah. your question. Right? Dr. Nicholas Perricone, uh, no stranger, as I said, to the world of public broadcasting. You've done many, many specials and, and taught many people, inspired many people to... Uh, to be involved in the aging process in a more productive and meaningful way. Um, board certified dermatologist, nutritionist, and expert on healthy uh, aging. I want to thank you, doctor. Thank Appreciate you. It. Stay Pleasure. Right there. Pleasure. We'll be right back right after this from the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of New York City. Thank you. Visit us online at steveautobato.org. Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Steve Adubato at the NJEA 2015 convention. We are honored, privileged to speak with Major General Charles Hooper, United States Army, senior U.S. defense official at the United States Embassy in Cairo, Egypt. All of these things are very important to introduce you. But the other reason we're talking to you is that you're receiving the NJEA Award for Excellence here at the convention. And uh, first of all, it is an honor to speak to you. Uh, General, thank you for your service to our country. But what does this award mean to you at this convention? Well, it's an amazing award, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, to be recognized out of all of the wonderful people, successful people, who have been uh, educated by the New Jersey system, uh, for me to be selected in this group of outstanding individuals is just a wonderful honor. And I'm very humbled and honored to receive this award. And we were just talking, uh, General and I were talking before he got on the air. He grew up in beautiful Willing Borough, New Jersey? The borough, absolutely. I, absolutely. It was a wonderful childhood, a wonderful place to grow up, and I received an exceptional, exceptional education in Willing Borough. Describe that. It was inclusive. It was innovative. Uh, the teachers were also mentors. They were coaches, and not only coaches in the athletic sense, they were life coaches. And so they prepared you, gave you the confidence and the tools to excel. So when I left home, I went to West Point, I could compete with anybody in the country because of the exceptional education I got in Willingboro, New Jersey. You know, in Willingboro, um, other than the general, there's another not so famous, uh, <laughs> you know, Carl Lewis came out of uh, Willingboro. And I just happened to mention him to you and you said, What's your connection to Carlos? His father was my high school track coach, and a lot of people's. And his father was an exceptional coach who brought out of each of his charges, no matter what ability, uh, the ability to try harder. No matter what your level of ability, he brought out the best in everyone, the best in his son, but the best in all of his charges. Uh, and he's one of the great teachers that inspired me uh, and helped me to succeed. So you talk about public school education. You know, uh, some of us who are a product, some are product of the Newark public schools, if you will. Um, you say what about public school education? And I know it matters from town to town, and clearly there are challenges in certain communities. Um, but you say what about public education? Public education in the United States is the vehicle, the vessel. It is what lifts up the American dream, it is what gives each child the opportunity, particularly now in an information-based age, uh, to rise above whatever their origins are, whatever their situation is. It gives them the knowledge to succeed, the confidence to succeed, um, and that's why public, uh, public education in this country is so very important, Steve. How did you wind up having such a distinguished career in the military? What drove you to that line of not only just work, but it's way more than work, that service to our country? I come from a, a, a family of teachers uh, and public servants. Really? Uh, most of my aunts, my mother's a retired Willingboro school teacher. Most of my aunts are retired New Jersey school teachers. And so they instilled in me a, a love of serving the community. Uh, not only were they teachers, they were very involved in the community. And, and for all of us children watching them, they served as role models. And so they, they, they infused in me this desire to serve the community, to serve my country. And simultaneously gave me the tools to do that. So I've always wanted to serve my country, serve the community. Uh, and they allowed me to do that and inspired me to do that. To what degree do you see yourself as a role model um, for others, but particularly young people, kids in our urban communities? I think, I hope, I serve as a role model for what is possible if you apply yourself, if you apply yourself to 
learn the tools and take advantage of all the opportunities available to you. Uh, I hope I serve as a role model of what they can accomplish. It's a big world out there. And you're not restricted to the environment that you're born into. And, and I hope that looking at me, they can dream one day. And I hope that they'll replace me in this uniform and one day you'll be interviewing one of them. A couple more questions. What does that uniform mean to you? Everything to me. It means my service to my country. It means that I represent my country wherever and wherever I may be and wherever I wear this uniform. Uh, and my country is everything to me and service to my country. So it is a living embodiment, and I am a living embodiment while I wear it, and even when I'm not wearing it, of everything that our country stands for. And I mean that in the most sincere way. I ask this question of uh, all leaders of all stripes, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, what would you say the greatest leadership lesson you have learned so far in your career is? Everyone has something to contribute. Everyone has something of value. It is the leader's job to find out what that is and to bring out the best in that person, whatever their contribution or potential contribution might be. It's not the leader's job to call or to chastise. It is the leader's job to inspire that individual, find out what their skill is, bring it out of them, and get them to perform the best that they can perform. That's the leader's job. And finally, the message to all the public school teachers, the educators at this 2015 NJA convention, your message to them. Thank you for everything that you do, because the defense of our nation, the prosperity of our nation, its very livelihood, its continued evolution rests in your hands. So thank you for what you do to prepare our children to assume leadership roles in this country. Thank you, General. You're very welcome. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, the Northward Center, Josh S. Weston, the Russell Berry Foundation, Investors Bank, and by NJM. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I am Dominique Lee. I was recognized in 2015 with the Russ Berry Award for making a difference for helping revitalize our school system in Newark. The award had a significant impact in my life. Help us identify and honor the unsung heroes in your New Jersey community who go unnoticed in their efforts to make a difference in the lives of others. You can nominate someone today for the Russ Berry Award for making a difference. The deadline for nominations is February 19, 2016.